So, hello everyone. Uh, sorry for this uh, little technical trouble here in the beginning. Uh, we are uh, happy to have you here today for this journal club. So, just uh, let me. Um, my name is Katiusia Casimiro, and I am a physical review editor. Uh, I'm going to be your host here today. And uh, let me just give a, a brief overview of what is this, this journal club. So the idea is really to have a, an informal conversation with the um, authors of uh, a paper recently published in, in, in our journals. And we really want also to, to kind of uh, promote the younger generation and keep everybody together here to, to, to have a chance to appear and ask your questions and, and be really um, acting as a community. Um, so yeah, I, I want to um, tell you a, f um, a few words about um, the Zoom. So since you wanna have this informal conversation, um, you're gonna be able to use your microphone and your camera, but I, I wanna ask you to please uh, keep it muted. Um, uh, if, if you are not uh, talking, keep yourself muted. Uh, and also, it would be good if you could use uh, your real name in, in the Zoom so that we can know each other a little bit. You can do that by if, if you see uh, your video, uh, you see your name written in there and you can click that to, to rename. Or if you go here in the participants list, you can uh, change your name. Uh, you have this pop up on the side and you can change your name here. So, uh, the meeting, it's um, 20 or so minutes of a uh, talk from uh, well, one of the authors. I'm going to say a little bit more soon. But you can uh, ask your questions at any point by typing it on the chat, or you can also use this button, raise a hand. And after the talk, uh, then uh, we would like to invite you to, to really come up and uh, say your questions aloud. Um, before we start, just let me tell you a little bit about this uh, new journal in the physical review. So PX Quantum is an open access journal where we want to really reach uh, this community, the quantum information uh, science and technology community. So it's an open access journal and our aim is really to publish um, outstanding research with um, so lasting and profound impact. Uh, we have already um, several published regular uh, papers, so I would like to invite you to keep a look in our website and also benefit from the fact that uh, to the end of uh, this year, uh, the publication fees are waived. Um, we are also uh, innovating in this uh, journal uh, with the fact that on the top of regular articles, we are bringing two new type of articles, perspectives and tutorials. So perspectives, um, uh, both type of articles, they are invited and uh, they are peer reviewed. But with perspectives, as the name says, we want to tell a little bit of uh, uh, the latest developments and focus pretty much on what are the open questions, what are the things that the community should uh, collaborate and get together to, to overcome uh, challenges and then be able to, to be developing in, in this field. So that's the idea with the perspectives. And we also have uh, tutorials. And with the tutorials, uh, we want to kind of speed up the training of uh, new quantum scientists. So the, uh, we always hear from the community that there is a big need now to be training uh, more people. And so we are um, inviting experts on, on several different uh, timely topics to write these tutorials uh, at a PhD level. So, and also if you are postdoc migrating fields and you want to connect with a, uh, with a new topic, so the tutorials uh, should, go, should be your go-to resource. Um, so having said all that, so we are very happy to have you here today, the group of Professor Johannes Fink. And I would like to, to thank um, uh, his group and uh, Andrea here who is gonna uh, 
describe these results that we're publishing in Physical Review Applied recently. And to help guide this conversation, I'm happy to have here Zlatko from IBM and perhaps to change a little bit to make it more interactive. Zlatko, can you tell a few words about yourself? So I'll um, hand it to you. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here. So thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure. And also, this is a very close to my heart work. Um, so I'm looking forward to moderating the questions with everyone on the call. And uh, thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I know this is you know midday or late in the evening for some people. Uh, so I did my, um, I guess I got into superconducting quantum devices with Irfan Siddiqui in 2007, then Michelle Devore for my PhD from 2011 to 2018, and then currently at IBM Quantum Research. The very first project I ever worked on in my PhD was superinductances. So I'm delighted to, um, to you know, have the chance to moderate this. Uh, I think this is a very, very awesome and interesting improvement. And you know, this is a big question, I think, in the community, especially with the new cool types of protected qubits and so on, you know, zero pi and, and, and other kinds of high inductance, super inductance type of devices. Uh, but for that, I'll let Andrea take over and uh, give you more of a perspective. So Andrea, um, would you like to yeah. sort of- Thank you, Slatko. And thanks to the organizer. Take over, sorry. Cool. Yeah, so thanks uh, to you and, your, and to the organizer for the interest in our work. Uh, my name is Andrea. I'm a PhD student in the group of quantum integrated devices at uh, IST Austria. And I am one of the two first co author together with Matilda of this paper that today I will talk about. So it's about the modeling, fabrication, and characterization of a new superconducting element, the geometric superinductor. And I will start introducing the concept of high impedance environment and characteristic impedance. Um, the idea of characteristic impedance for an electrical signal uh, is similar to that of wave impedance for a plane wave. In wave impedance is defined as the ratio between the strength of electric and magnetic field, and for an ideal dielectric is an intrinsic property of the medium, depending only on the magnetic permeability and the electric permittivity. Now, the characteristic impedance is conceptually equivalent, but refer to the components of an electrical circuit. So it's the ratio between the amplitude of voltage and current for a single propagating electrical signal and it's an attribute of any circuit, regardless of whether or not they are connected to a load or to a power source. And in case of lossless circuit, is just the square root of the ratio between inductance and capacitance. But to make this analogy more uh, formal, we can map the Maxwell equation that describes plane wave in an homogeneous um, and isotropic medium, a distributed element, to the telegraph equation that describe the TEM um, um, in chains of lumped element derived from circuit theory. And as a result, you, we can see that the element of the circuit model, LNC, can be related to the parameter of the medium. Now, if we disregard any magnetic material, the wave impedance, um, it's upper limited by the impedance of the vacuum. That's the medium with lowest permittivity, it's 377 ohm. Now, the question that, that I will try to answer in this introduction is, uh, do we have the same conclusion apply also to electrical circuit? So let's look into conventional circuits. And the first big distinction needs to be made between if we are applying a DC signal or an AC signal. So in case of DC signal, the surface is just um, a network of resistors and the characteristic impedance is the overall resistance. In this case, we have no upper bound, but resistors are not suitable for quantum application. That's the topic we are interested into and because they are lossy and they introduce decoherence in the quantum system. So, but when we apply AC signal to a lossless transmission line, 
then the only electrical component allowed are inductors and capacitor. And the characteristic in pieces is this square root of their ratio. Now, if we refer to lossless cables, uh, their impedance is still bounded to the vacuum impedance because the inductance and capacitance scale in the same way. And if we try to increase the distance to the ground in order to decrease the capacitance, what we obtain is a circuit with a dimension in the order of the wavelength of the signal. So this circuit is starting behaving as an antenna, and so radiating, and again, is limit is bounded to Z vacuum. Also, if we consider an inductor, uh, a, a real inductor is not an ideal element. It has some capacitance due uh, to, the, um, to the turns that are close to each other. And even if miniaturization uh, at, at, the, um, at the state of the art, uh, is able to, to get uh, coils with impedance in order of kilo ohm at 100 of megahertz resonant frequency, still when we move to the gigahertz, uh, this uh, characteristic impedance is around the impedance of the vacuum. And a naive explanation for this is that if we want to realize the lumped element in this frequency range, then we need to be in the order of millimeter size. So it's quite challenging to pack in this small volume, uh, high inductance and small capacitance. But why, why do we care for high impedance? Why do we aim for this goal? Um, in quantum circuits, and in particular in superconducting circuits, high impedance can be beneficial both for artificial atom, but also to build up high quality resonator. Um, this is a platform uh, that is extremely interesting to study uh, light matter interaction and perform quantum computation. For, for resonators, the impedance can enhance the electric field zero point fluctuations, allowing stronger coupling between the resonator and the atom. That could be a superconducting circuit, a quantum dot, or an hybrid system. Speaking about qubits, high impedance can suppress charge fluctuations. And in this regime, the phase is decompactified and the wave function is spread along the potential. So this approach of delocalized information helps protecting from flux noise, example in the fluxonium qubit, but also it allows to avoid the overlap between or minimize the overlap between different wave function support in protected qubit, for example, zero pi qubit. But there are applications also beyond circuit QED for this high impedance environment, for example, in the met metamaterial community or in metrology. But in this case, what do I mean when I say high impedance? So if we consider an LC quantum circuit, the quantum fluctuation of uh, charge and phase with respect um, their natural units, the Cooper pair and the flux quantum, have an opposite dependence on the characteristic impedance of the circuit. So at low impedance, the flux is well-defined with tiny fluctuations, while at high impedance, the charge is the good variable with suppressed fluctuations. And here, when I say high and low, the threshold is this resistant quantum RQ, that's the ratio between the flux quantum and the charge of a Cooper pair. And this can be interpreted as the natural scale of impedance at the quantum level. So given the motivation in the previous slide, it would be beneficial to realize a quantum large inductor, a superinductor, um, with the following characteristics. Uh, zero resistance in DC, characteristic impedance above RQ when an AC signal is applied, and a wave function residing in the ground state at millikelvin temperature. That means frequency in the gigahertz range. So is there a new upper boundary uh, when we talk about these quantum circuits? So it's a widespread idea that the pure geometric inductance cannot go above the vacuum impedance, 
but with our work, we prove that it's possible to overtake uh, even the resistant quantum. Uh, to reach this limit, superinductors up to now uh, were based only on the enhancement of the kinetic component of the inductance that comes from the kinetic energy of the charge carrier of a nine mobility conductor, like a superconductor. So one of the first implementation was the Josephson junction array. And the idea is that a single junction can be seen as a nonlinear inductor. And a naive explanation for this is that um, the oxide barrier of this seri series of junction is what is impeding in this case, the flow of the current. Um, another approach is to boost the kinetic inductance by reducing the superconducting wire lateral dimension uh, W, uh, making nanowires or increasing the normal state resistivity by using disordered materials like the granular aluminum. And in these cases, we're impeding the current flow, shrinking the channel or with the dielectric boundaries between the superconducting metal uh, grains. So with our work, we proved that a geometric inductor is indeed possible and that can be realized with a miniaturized planar coil on an engineer substrate. So now we can look uh, better into this. What is the working principle of the coil inductor? So the current flowing in the coil uh, leads to a magnetic field which impedes the charges to flow. And this effect is enhanced by the adjacent turns. Um, the inductance of the coil is, of this planar coil is proportional to the cube of N, the number of turns. And so this is a strong dependency. So the coil, it's a distributed element, it's millimeter long. And if we look at this plot, that represent the current distribution, um, we can see that the yellow dots that represent simulated value of the current for one of our coil, it has the same behavior as the blue line that describes um, the current distribution for a generic lambda alpha resonator. Another, another thing is that um, the resonant frequencies for the coils are integer value of the fundamental resonant frequency, F0, uh, like a lambda alpha resonator. But this is not a trivial uh, conclusion. It's obtained from the full electrodynamical study of the coil, and it holds only for large n, uh, large number of turns, and filling factor equal to one. Because if you consider a coil, more similar to a ring, so with an internal radius uh, comparable to the external one, this conclusion doesn't hold anymore. But now let's see how we, if we can, how we can go above RQ. And it's interesting to compare the coil with the straight wire. So the straight wire as a lambda alpha resonator has a resonant frequency that scale as one over length. And the same scaling appears in the coil. In the case of the coil, we have a bit more capacitance. And so from the plot, you can see uh, that the, the line of the coil is uh, underneath the one for the straight wire. But things change when we move to uh, the characteristic impedance. Um, in the case of the straight wire, uh, this is a constant value. I said before, L and C scale in the same way with length and it's usually below Z vacuum. But in case of coil, the characteristic impedance goes as the square root of its length. So now if you look at the plot, we see that for devices with um, characteristic impedance above RQ, their um, resonant frequency is in the gigahertz regime. For this plot, we choose to have uh, coils in vacuum, we simulated coils in vacuum. So epsilon r for this case is equal to one, but I will introduce later what's the effect of the substrate. This is just a proof of principle. Last thing here, 
is the lambda element model. So from now on in this discussion, we will model the coil as a lambda element, as an LC circuit. In the plot is shown the imaginary part of the admittance. The yellow dots represent the simulated points for one of our coils. And the blue line is the admittance for an LC circuit with L and C equal to the L and C of the coil. As you can see around the resonant frequency, they overlap. So the coil can be modeled as an LC circuit around F0. Below F0, the admittance is negative. This means it behaves as an inductor. And in order to um, model the higher resonant frequencies, we just have to add LC branches to this original LC model. Um, two are the tactics we use uh, in order to uh, fabricate this high impedance planar coil. The first one is miniaturization. So de we decrease the pitch size since fix the length, this leads to larger density of turns, so a larger inductance. And we decrease the pitch from one micron down to 200 nanometer. The other approach is uh, engineering the substrate to decrease the capacity. Um, the idea here is to remove as much the electric as possible to reduce the substrate permittivity and so the capacitance. We realize um, a first set of devices on silicon using standard fabrication technique. So electron beam lithography, aluminum evaporation and liftoff. And this is the typical substrate used in quantum integrated device. But now we move to a new substrate called SOI, silicon and insulator, that's composed by three layers, the silicon handle at the bottom, three micron of silicon dioxide, the yellow in between in the sketch. And on top, we have 200 nanometer silicon layer. The first step in this case of the fabrication is to etch a lattice of holes in the area of the chip where we will fabricate the coils. Then um, we just repeat the standard fabrication, so lithography, evaporation, liftoff. And then we place the sample in a chamber with hydrofluoridic acid at the vapor state. And in this condition, the vapor is able to remove the dioxide layer in the middle passing through the holes we etched in the first layer. In this way, we obtain a coil suspended on a thin silicon membrane, 200 nanometer, with a free uh, micron air gap underneath. The third set of devices um, was made by pushing this approach to the limit. So again, we start from an SOI sample. Uh, we pattern and etch the holes. We fabricate the coils and then we flip the chip and we etch all the silicon handle down to the silicon dioxide that we remove in the last step using again the HF vapor technique. So in this case, we increase the air gap. The device is now almost floating in the vacuum and the only substrate is this 200 nanometer silicon membrane. So we fabricated and measure more than 100 devices, the dots in the figure, with different combination of pitch, number of turns on the free substrate that I described in the previous slide. So each point in the figure is one device and the lines are the fit to this analytical formula on the left side where we have three parameters, N and P that are the turns and the pitch and effective epsilon. That's our only fitting parameter. And from the fit of these set points, we extract that the effective epsilon goes down from almost seven in the case of silicon 
to 1.25 in, in case of SOI backhatched. So almost uh, a device in pure vacuum. This is about resonant frequency. Um, the other measurement was about the quality factor. So on the left side, you can see the, quality, the intrinsic uh, Q for a representative overcoupled device, a coil with pitch 300 nanometer on SOI backhatched as a function of the Indra resonator uh, photon number. The blue dots are the value that we extracted from a Laurentian fit, and the blue band is the 90% confidence interval. Uh, the yellow line instead is a fit to a TLS model. And in this case, you can see we are able to obtain Q factor up to seven, uh, 10 to the five at single photon number with one photo in the resonator. On the right hand side, you can see the linearity plot. Um, so you can see the frequency shift of 0.24 milliards per photon obtained from this yellow linear fit uh, of the measurement data that are the blue dots. So it's truly a linear uh, device. Um, here, instead, it's explained how we derive the value of the characteristic impedance for each of the device. So we measure the resonant frequency, as I explained in the previous slide. And now, knowing the inductance uh, of the coil through this formula, that we also confirm, that's a, a, something you can find in literature, but that we also confirm using finite finite element method simulations, we can extract the characteristic impedance for each device. And you can notice from the plot that already on silicon, we have a bunch of devices at gigahertz frequency above our Q, and that these become easier moving to the engineer substrate. Our record value is a, coil, a device with resonant frequency um, around five gigahertz and characteristic impedance of above 30 kilo ohm that correspond to a coil with inductance of one micro Henry and capacitance of one femtofarad. So this is how characteristic impedance scale. Let's see how capacitance scale. Um, capacitance scales linearly with the coil's diameter. So in the panel A, top right, um, it's represented the extracted capacitance per unit radius for the three different substrate. The dots represent the average capaci capacitance that you would add by increasing the radius of the coil by one micron. And the large error bar for SOI is explained in the inset and is due to the inhomogeneity of the substrate that's like silicon or silicon. In panel B, the other plot, all the points represented here correspond to different devices, but on different substrate, but with the same resonant frequency, 10.7 gigahertz, so it's clear how fixed uh, the substrate, so let's take, for example, so, uh, silicon, the yellow line, uh, it's clear how decreasing the pitch fixed the resonant frequency. We can increase the characteristic impedance or the other way around, fix the pitch. We can enhance the resonant frequency, uh, the characteristic impedance, sorry, just changing the substrate. So in the last part of the talk, I will briefly show you how in our group we are using this geometric superinductor. Um, one application for the geometric superinductor would be the realization of fluxonium type qubits. And Matilda, for example, is working on this. Uh, three are the relevant energy for a fluxonium, the inductive, charging, and um, Josephson the energy. And in a geometric superinductor, um, in a geometric fluxonium, it's possible 
to change EL and EC, just changing the pitch and the size of the coil as shown in the plot. Uh, in the top right is shown our geometry, how uh, one of our geometric flaxonium uh, look like. In order to close the loop and contact the Josephson junction, we need to connect the center of the coil and our solution to do this is this series of air bridges that you can see in the inset. Um, with this flexibility given by the coil, it's possible to obtain the entire spectrum of um, qubit from flux qubit to block new. The large inductance can be used also to protect for qubit, for protected qubit. And this is what Farid is working on like the zero pi. So in the zero pi design, uh, you need the circuit elements to have uh, pairwise, um, to be pairwise identical. And for this, the reproducibility of the coils represent a plus um, to access the deep protected regime of the zero pi. Also the possibility to couple magnetically without a galvanic connection enables strong coupling while preserving the circuit symmetry. And the fact that everything is suspended on a membrane is reducing, is reducing all the unwanted parasitic capacitances. And last uh, applications is about single Josephson junction. So in high impedance environment is one of the requirement to realize um, a phase lip junction, that's the dual element of the Josephson junction. Since charge fluctuations are suppressed, in this kind of device, it's possible to observe Coulomb blockade effects. But when you current bias this device and you apply an AC drive, um, it's predicted that voltage plateau will appear in the IV curve at specific current values that are related to the frequency of the AC drive. And since frequency is a quantity known with high accuracy, thanks to the atomic clock technology, uh, the ampere is not, and this could lead to a better definition of the ampere, for example. So resistor plus superinductors can solve the problem of thermal heating and parasitic capacitance that's creating this shunting effect. So this is it. I want to thank you all for the attention. I want to thank my group, all the co-authors and the colleagues because every result in the research is always a team effort. And I want to conclude just with the list of the main results of the geometric superinductor. So compared to other implementation, the geometric superinductor has comparable quality factor and characteristic impedance. What is unique about these electrical components is that they are single wave function device. They're highly linear and they have the possibility to couple magnetically. Um, then the low capacitance that's usually between one and five femtofarad um, allow to have high zero point voltage fluctuation. That's interesting for uh, coupling with hybrid system, for example. And the fact that the inductance is purely, almost purely geometric means that it can be combined with a kinetics uh, superinductor. Uh, Sometimes the fabrication looks more artistic than effective, but this is what we get. Thanks. Thank you, Andrea, for the very nice talk, and thank you, team, for sharing. Um, that is that is a beautiful image. Maybe the first yes, question. It's, we'll it's from Matilda. People... It's from Matilda. Okay, yeah. great. I think the first question will probably be, can you tell us what that image is? But um, otherwise, folks, feel we can keep this very casual. I think the idea is to have more you know, round table fireside chat uh, here. You can either, I guess, post questions in the chat or, or unmute yourself politely and um, ask your question. I, I have a few questions lined up, uh, but maybe Andrea, did you just want to tell us a bit more about the image first? So this is just an artistic lift off of one of the coils. 
Okay, it's not like uh, the membrane is underneath snap or anything. Got it. Um, okay, so I think maybe for the first question, we'll start with Christian, Christian Anderson's question. Um, Christian, would you like to ask this one yourself? Yeah, I can, I can do that. Um, yeah, I just so got to- Do you mind just giving a like, two sentence introduction of who you are, where you're from? Uh, I mean, I already yes. know, but- <laughs> uh, Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Christian Anderson. I'm uh, currently a postdoc uh, at uh, ETH uh, Zurich, uh, uh, working in the group of uh, Andreas uh, Walraff. Previously, I did a PhD in the uh, theory of uh, circuit QED. And uh, very soon I will move uh, to a new lab in uh, TU Delft. And I would like to ask a, a question. I got curious when you were describing uh, sort of the sort of uh, more basic theory you had on this. You made this analogy that you could think of the coil as a lambda half resonator. Uh, and I just got curious. Uh, I, I have not thought so much about sort of this coil geometry, but it has sort of a quite interesting uh, current uh, distribution. I sort of uh, yeah, it's, I guess it's sort of the, it's the lambda half, but it's sort of skewed because you have this increasing radius, right? How yes. would that look now if you would, let's say, ground one of the ends and then have more like a lambda quarter resonator? Uh, so I yes, it... um, I think Matilda or Martin have an answer to this because we looked into different boundary condition for the coil. So in case of the resonator, it's just lambda half, but when you close the loop to make a qubit or something, then the condition changes and of course so the current distribution changes. So if they want to fly. Yeah, I can I can answer. Uh, you're absolutely correct. If you we we were looking into this in simulation, so we didn't do any uh, test chips, but we um, we showed in simulation that if you ground one side, you get a lambda quarter, and then if you uh, connect the two sides like without a junction, you get uh, a lambda resonator. Uh, okay. But I can't think of any any I mean, other than qubits like applications, especially for the lambda quarter. But okay. it could definitely work. Yeah, but I was more thinking: to, could you get sort of like a factor of let's say maybe like square root of two in characteristic impedance one way or the other if you make it a lambda quarter uh, uh, compared to size. Mm. Uh, or is there no sort of scaling like that? I I am I I don't know I, I, exactly. I would think maybe you would might you might get a you'll get a good uh, scaling if you go to the lambda uh, side rather okay, than I the see. lambda quarter. Ah, okay, I okay, think so. because your effective capacitance goes down. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that makes sense actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Is that interesting? I guess that raises two interesting questions that I had myself. One is, you know, where do you define the impedance uh, when you talk about it, right? Because that, if it's just a lumped element inductor, then I guess it's from the two ends. But if you're thinking of it as an actual transmission line, then it's more complicated. Because I had a different interpretation of this picture. Maybe, maybe both are equally valid, not as a transmission line, but actually as a purely just inductive, uh, you know, mutual, high mutual inductance thing. And the, my understanding was the current is high in the middle, not because it's you know, there's nodes and anti-nodes of the current, like it's not a lambda over four, it's, it's it, there's no capacitance in the structure. Maybe I'm wrong for this picture, but I, I just understood it because there's a lot of mutual uh, uh, inductive coupling in the middle. So this could be in the lumped regime where it's not a distributed resonator, but actually just purely inductive, no capacitance whatsoever in that picture. Is that also a valid interpretation? I would say. Um, we have the maximum of the, so the magnetic field is not really going through it uh, each turn, but it's more a general field. So going around um, one radius of the coil. And so with the maximum magnetic field in the center, we have the maximum of the current just in the central turns. Because maybe schematically, from like a circuit schematic point of view, could one think of this as as a series of inductors that then have sort of mutual inductance with you know kind of in the spiral way, like one radii over two radii, and 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 that's what you know putting a little bit of current in the middle, then you know transfers current to all the nearby uh, parts of the coil as well. So there are some electric engineering paper about this, but 
none of the simplified formula they um, summarize or use can be applied to um, our geometry at least. Um, but I think it's a valid way of thinking. Okay. I would just like to add that in terms of the inductance, it's it's very well understood and there's multiple ways to model it. This, in the same way as for a capacitor, it's easy to calculate the capacitance and, and kind of difficult to think of the parasitic inductance. Here it's really, there's no model, a good model for predicting the parasitic capacitance uh, or very complicated models that have all some funny assumptions. But it's very easy to get the induct predict the inductance, uh, also with analytical means and similar models that you suggest. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, the agreement between analytics and simulation is pretty awesome. So that's that's really nice. Um, we we could keep in this direction, but maybe we should pause and uh, see if anyone else would like to uh, raise questions. Meanwhile, you can unmute yourself. Uh, you don't have to introduce yourself if you don't want to. Uh, or you can post them in the chat box and we'll take them that way. So let me just give people a few seconds to see if they'd like to unmute and ask another question. And while folks are thinking of questions, maybe we could just take it a little bit further on this. Could you remind us by simulation, sort of what is the simulation that is, is done here? I guess it's a purely magnetostatic simulation and uh, it doesn't, can you, to what degree can you actually try to calculate this uh, parasitic capacitance to the ground plane or, or so on? Uh, you know, what, what sort of this, because this was a big challenge also for the <clears throat> superinductance arrays in that uh, Nick Maslick paper you mentioned earlier in the talk. <clears throat> that was one of the main things of that paper was exactly trying to model and optimize the self capacitance, the capacitance to ground so as to reduce the face slip rate of those junction arrays. Um, and I guess here you, you want to reduce the self capacitance, not for the face slips, which is beautiful that you can eliminate that, <clears throat> but for the plasma frequency. Um, so maybe if you'd like to comment on that. Andre, should I go? Yes, if you want. So we did a few uh, simulations to kind of uh, figure this out. Uh, I would say like maybe the the first one was that we would simulate, so we simulate the coil as a resonator and we simulate the, so we basically um, take out the resonance frequency and then we would add a capacitance in series and slowly increase that and then try to extract from that what the original parasitic capacitance was from the change in, in frequency. Uh, otherwise, we did the simulation uh, as like the lumped element, the one that uh, is now not on the slide, but uh, yes, this one. And from this one, we, yeah, we did the fit to the LC model. And from there, from uh, taking the derivative at, at F0, you can find the straight capacitance of the circuit. And these two were uh, in good agreement. And so those were the main, the main methods. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, I think, oh yes, yeah, so we have a question. Would you like to ask this one myself, yourself or should I take it? Uh, I, I, I can ask. So, of course, I'm not expert in, in this topic, but uh, in your paper, you make it very clear that uh, uh, people believe that it was not possible to to have this, uh, this effect just playing with geometry, right? Mm -hmm. But still, you, you went in this direction and showed that, yes, you can. So I was just wondering how, how this project started from where came the inspiration to, to go in this direction if everybody was saying that it was not a good way to, to do it. Well, I think the best person to answer is Johannes from most of the time. Can you show the backup slide, uh, Andrea? Yes. I <laughs> so um, I would say it started when I was at Caltech in, uh, um, in Oscar Painter's lab and we basically tried to couple strongly uh, tiny mechanical high-frequency oscillators to microwave circuits. 
And uh, we realized we have to cut the parasitic capacitance as much as possible. Uh, and, and, and I went about this problem uh, as a, a, like an electrical engineering person with simulations and uh, some equations uh, uh, that are known about the inductance. And I didn't see a limit. And at some point at a conference, somebody told me, hey, what you're doing is impossible. Why, why are you doing this? And then, and then I, I read, uh, I also met uh, Kitaev and Preskill sometimes, and they have also an interesting paper where they say, we take it for granted that such an element can be made. And if it can be made, you can do this fancy topology, uh, like this error protected readouts and, and things like this and gates. So I thought, wow, I, I think we actually could do this. And then I, and I, and I started to explore some of these uh, statements that I shown here, which, which say basically it, it, it shouldn't be possible. And that was certainly one of the motivations just to, to show it's not true. But, but on the way, we, we also think we, we, we found some other applications where it might actually help because it's a, a single wave function device and you cannot have charge offsets. Uh, and um, also because um, it's pretty well engineerable and predictable what you get. It's just uh, given by geometry. There is also some disadvantages, of course, but in particular for the original purpose, this was really a game changer that helped us achieve really nice results. Even though we didn't go quite as far in this limit, uh, we used it for many nice uh, electromechanics experiments, uh, which wouldn't have been possible otherwise. Uh, because there you need both high linearity and tiny parasitic capacitance and large uh, zero point fluctuations. Thank you, Johannes. And we have a follow up or a question from Christian. Um, yes, yeah, I just had one more question that I, I wanted to ask. Uh, at the sort of end of your uh, outlook, or in the middle of your outlook, I guess it was, uh, you showed this uh, fluxonium uh, type device where you had these air bridges uh, going over. Okay. Um, and, and I just wondered, uh, one of the sort of uh, advantages that you keep mentioning in, in this, and which I think is, is very nice also, is that you this it seems more reproducible than, let's say, a junction array. But when I look at this sort of uh, zoom in of these air bridges, it, it seems maybe less reproducible, or at least it seems a bit more disordered sort of when it goes over compared to sort of the geometry itself. Uh, could you sort of comment on, let's say, how reproducible this air bridge technique also is? Uh, yes, uh, so the bridges are quite reproducible because we are able to obtain uh, devices in different regimes. Uh, in this picture, the wire width, wire width is really small. It's probably 150 nanometers. So, of course, they are less stable when the, the wire is so tiny. Um, but even if they look like they are touching each other, they are kind of oxidized, so they are not creating any short. And if you are scared about the additional capacitance that this type of um, um, bridges um, are adding to the circuit. We got, it's only about a couple of percent because the parameters of the uh, qubit are very similar to what they are. Like. If Matilda, you want to add something else, or if Christian? Wants. No, no, that is that that is uh, exactly what I was. Okay, saying. I see. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually, yeah, I, I, I understand that from capacitance point of view, it, it's a small length, so that should not probably not matter too much, but I was mostly worried about the, let's say, contacts and short, uh, but as you say, okay, it's oxidized and, and that gives you enough protection. Just yes. two or three, I have one comment about it. So this, um, this disorder uh, doesn't happen for all the devices, but sometimes it happens. Also, it doesn't happen when we make it, but in a, in a in a subsequent layer, because we actually spin and bake on the freestanding bridges. Um, and then sometimes, depending on their shape, they deform. And uh, uh, maybe so the last comment. I, so, you, so you do that for the to make the junction in a, afterwards? Yes. Yeah, yes. Okay, I see. Yes. Yeah. So, so things like this could potentially be changed. And then the last comment, maybe, I think it's important to realize that the adjacent turns are roughly on the same potential 
in this large n limit, which is also the reason why it doesn't cause great parasitic capacitance. Uh, and therefore, there's very little field uh, dropping between the turns and that probably helps to keep the losses reasonable, even though this is happening. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, thanks, mm. That's very nice, thank you. Uh, Matt, I see you have your hand raised. Thanks, uh, very nice. Um, you touched on this maybe a little bit, but not directly what I had in mind. So I think it's fair to say what enabled all of this progress that you've made was the actual um, fabrication and nanotechnology aspect of this work. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? I don't mean like growth conditions and things like that necessarily, but you know, how special is the fab setup that you have? Could someone else do this? Are you the only people in the world that could create these things presently? I mean, how, um, what are the prospects in those terms for other people being able to do this kind of stuff and actually make their own applications in their own labs? So I would say um, the fabrication is the challenge for these super inductors. You showed the nice, you, you saw, the nice picture at the end. Uh, it's a uh, five to seven layer fabrication, so it's not short or easy, but we were able to make it work reliably because we produce more than 100 devices and we have uh, also many qubits in different regimes. Uh, each step I would say is, is the standard fabrication process. So for each step is not, um, a problem to be able to reproduce it. But of course, uh, you need to um, um, tune all the process because they affect each other from the dimension of the holes in the first etching to the last HF vapor release. And yes, also the dimensions of the, of the wires. They need, the resisting between needs to be stable, otherwise they collapse one into, into the other, the membrane needs to be stable, but silicon is quite good substrate for this. And while coils not at this limit were, were uh, realized in other groups, um, but with just pitch, with larger pitch, also with the crossovers, if I don't, if I'm not mistaken, maybe someone else want to comment. Thank you. And um, maybe a follow up question to that. You know, do you see a path forward where you, perhaps you could do this on silicon or sapphire and you wouldn't need to, to do this uh, etching or suspension? You know, by changing the geometry or, or having um, maybe not a spiral, but, you know, some sort of other geometric features. Um. I mean, maybe maybe Farid can comment with the yes, so, new new version of the fab. Yes, yeah, so we are constantly improving on the fabrication because we we believe we know that is it is challenging. So uh, actually, we we are working on a on a inverse coil fabrication. We basically you edge instead of lift off. So lift off has its own limitations. You can only go because you, as you can see, especially in this slide, miniatur miniaturization is one of the main things uh, that improves the performance of the coil. And uh, if you can edge, then you can actually miniaturize much, much more. And then, then you can just uh, achieve higher impedances, uh, characteristic impedances, even in silicon. So then that's one of the things that we are pushing at the moment. Um, I think maybe in the future we'll see probably we'll see the new fabrication recipe, I guess. Then, uh, yeah, it has to be, it, it has to be well implemented and then we can push the pitch basically and miniaturize more. I see that you, um, you uh, evaporate the aluminum first and you, you were talking about, oh, it's all oxidized. So, you know, you don't have to worry about that kind of short contact, but then you expose it to the HF, and I'm I'm glad that the the hydrofluoric acid doesn't chew up the oxide at all, because then that might create a whole host of other things. And any uh, any remarks on that? That was the parameter tuning I was talking about before. 
I would say the HF recipe is probably, you can find it standard, but yes, you need to be in the right regime. Do not have organization or remove the oxide. Right amount of HF and water. So yeah, the HF, the HF process is not so standard in our community, maybe in the superconducting cubic community because liquid HF immediately eats aluminum. But uh, these anhydro, how is it called? Uh, well, these water, sort of water-free um, vapor process is actually a standard process in CMOS. And uh, if you buy a, a more professional machine than, than the thing that heats up the HF with a lamp, then, then, you, then you don't see aluminum etching, uh, usually, if, unless you choose crazy parameters. But something we definitely did see is deposition of, of, of uh, things we don't want. So to tune that uh, was definitely also some, some effort. Thank you. Um, I guess with that, maybe we should take one final question before uh, showing our final slide. Is there a final question from the audience? Otherwise, I think I have one myself. Feel free to unmute yourself or post in the chat. I was interested. So I kind of understood that the non, the inherent nonlinearity due to the kinetic inductance is very small from your work. So I think there was about 5% kinetic inductance uh, and a very small self-cur effect of the self-resonance. Uh, but it seemed like the quality factor was still power dependent, even below the single photon level. Could, is that, you know, something you expect from the sort of two level system model, uh, or is just because of the high participation, I guess, that you think you might see of two level systems in this? Cause I think for norm, for larger, larger feature CPW resonators, I don't think usually you see quite as much of that. Um, or is that maybe a calibration question of uncertainty? You know, is that an expected feature or maybe not? Is that uh, we want the backup slide? Uh, yeah, maybe no, just go to the, the slide with the, the TNS. Yeah. Um, so you're talking about, uh, so the, yeah, the thing is you don't have that many points under, uh, under one photon to probably say this with accuracy. And uh, it's there. There definitely could be. There's definitely some uncertainty with regards to the calibration. Um, from my experience, the like this, the the fit that we did has this um, critical photon number, uh, which is quite low, um, which means that the uptick of the quality factor happens quite early on and quite low photon powers. Uh, but I don't know what this is is due to. Okay. Oh, and uh, I think that, that goes with the question I missed earlier, which is what if you did niobium instead of aluminum or you know some other material with a higher uh, gap? Uh, you know, would would that provide some potential benefits? I don't know, Andrea. I mean, we are working also on this. Maybe Farid. Can answer. <laughs> Just bouncing. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, niobium, of course, can help uh, if you want to introduce a magnetic field and then, for example, couple it to a quantum dot. Um, this is one application I can think of. Um, it's something on the plate, but we don't have final results about this yet. Okay, maybe an open question. Well, I'd like to, with that, thank you, Andrea, for the presentation. Thank you to the team for answering all the questions during the live and a. Don't go away just yet. I think we have one more slide, uh, so I'll turn it over. Uh, and yes. Can you see the slide, right? We can see the okay, slide. So, yeah, thank you so much for everybody for being here today, Andrea, for this nice talk and all the authors for, for this, this uh, conversation. And thanks a lot, uh, Zlatko, for the moderation. And I just want to say that next week we have another journal club. It's going to be uh, on Thursday. 
Uh, so it's a paper on quantum metrology that was recently published on PX Quantum. So um, yeah, come again. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this event and see you in the next one. Thank you.